In this video, we're going to construct a peak model for these data. We're going to use the quantification parameters dialog window, and this will allow us to create a background using the regions property page, and a set of component peaks that are components within a peak model that will represent these data. The first step is to define a background. The component peaks will then be added to the background to fit these data. We have a background type that is a U3 Tugar background. In fact, these data are such that the background is very flat, and regardless of the background type, we would end up with a very flat background. Whether it's Shirley, Linear, or Tugar, it turns out to be the same. However, what we can change is the average width, which determines the number of data points that will tie the data and the background at either end of the region. So I've assigned a value of five, That'll give me five points outside, five points inside, and the point itself. So we've got 11 points at this end and also at this end that will tie the data and the background together. After we've got a background, we can add some component peaks. And if we add two peaks, then this produces two columns within the components property page. And these represent two nitrogen 1s peaks. They have line shapes defined, they're both defined to be the same. There is an area parameter, a full width half maximum parameter, and also a position parameter for each one of these peaks. And these will be adjusted to fit the data when the fit component button is pressed. And they will move according to an optimization sequence from the current position to a new position within these ranges that are defined by the area constraint forward half maximum constraint and the position constraint. And these constraints limit the possible values for the parameters that are allowed when fitting these peaks to the data. So I'll press the fit components button and we end up with what looks like a plausible peak fit for these particular data involving two peaks. There is one problem however, is that these data are from a material which is an ionic liquid that represents a mixture of two ionic liquids and the chemistry of these liquids suggests that there are at least four peaks in this peak model so although we have a reasonable fit and you can see that as far as the residual standard deviation is concerned this is a re reasonable fit for pulse counted data that this is not a physically meaningful fit taken in isolation a data envelope such as this one will be difficult to produce a, a peak model for which we could have any confidence in the assignment of peaks and peak positions or even relative areas. And this is because there are more than two peaks within this data envelope. And we know this because of the sample itself. These samples were prepared from two ionic liquids by mixing these ionic liquids in different proportions. So assuming we haven't performed any chemistry on these samples as a consequence of mixing these ionic liquids, then we might expect to find a peak at a binding edge that corresponds to these negative ions, and these positive ions would represent three nitrogen components at different binding energies and in different intensity ratios. If we assume we have these ions within these mixtures, then we should find a one-to-one -one relationship between this positive ion and this negative ion and a two to one relationship between these. And this is the type of information that allows us to move forwards when constructing a peak model. If we return to the data, we can then investigate the relationships of peaks within these peaks. Well, first of all, we have to have two here. So if I copy and paste, and actually what I'll do is I'll group these by cutting and pasting. So now I've got the first peak here represents the negative ions and these two peaks would have to represent the positive ions. So if I say fit I end up with a relationship and this relationship may or may not have any physical meaning because this is just a mathematical solution. And it's not until I actually do the same action, I'll cut this one, I'll paste twice, and then introduce some constraints. So I'm claiming that 
one of these peaks must be in a certain proportion to the other peak. So this is a negative ion and I want this to be a positive ion where they're of equal value. So I'm going to say A star 1. And what I did here was I imposed a constraint on this peak so it has to be the same area as this peak in this peak model. And then I need to go here and this time I need column B and I'm going to make this one half the size. So now I've got a relationship between these two peaks where one is half the size of the other and these are the same size. So when I say fit I end up with a peak model where I get a set of peaks They've adjusted to give me a reasonable residual standard deviation. But once again, this is not a physically meaningful peak fit. The idea is that these two peaks here must represent the same negative ion. So in order for that to be true, they should have the same forward half maximum in the same position. And this is not the case. So what I'm going to do now is identify these two peaks as having the same fourth half maximum, so I'm going to say C star 1. This is in column D, so they now have the same fourth half maximum. And I'm also going to constrain this one so that it is at the same position as C. So I've said C plus 0. So rather than fitting and allowing these two peaks to take up a different fourth half maximum position, Forcing them to be the same when I say fit now produces a peak fit that has a very good residual standard deviation. And the question is, is this now a good peak fit and is it representative of the chemistry that we have in these samples? The residual standard deviation would suggest that we have good data reproduction with this peak model. But the question is, is this a genuine physically meaningful peak model or not. And one of the simplest tests to do is to see what happens if I alter the starting conditions for this peak model. So when I press fit, well I've ended up with a very similar residual standard deviation, but you can see here that the peaks have taken up a completely different binding energy position. And this would be difficult to justify on physical grounds. In fact, this demonstrates the lack of uniqueness in this peak model. So this would not be a good way of measuring the different proportions of these two ionic liquids. The root of the problem with this peak model is that we're focusing on one spectrum. And the spectrum contains highly correlated information. And the combination of these two factors makes it very difficult to work out the relationship for the binding energies for these two peaks that come from the positive ions. Fortunately, the data set includes examples of the individual ionic liquids, so we can see the area relationships, and we can also see the binding energy relationships between these peaks. So, armed with these two additional spectra, after we've calibrated them so that the one peak aligns with the other, we should then have a binding energy scale that will allow us to see the separation of these two component peaks and introduce this into the peak model. One way to work out the offset between these peaks is to put on a simple peak model and work out the offset from the peak model itself. So let's produce a peak model for each one of these and I'm going to use two peaks in both cases. Let's just propagate the peak model that I've just created to the other ion liquid. And if we look at the peak model for the first ion liquid, then we can see there's an offset here that can be calculated if we type in in column B A, referring to the column A header here, and then just press return and it will calculate the offset between these two peaks. And similarly, if we display the other ion liquid and enter again 
A in column B for the position, we see we have a different offset. So now we have binding energy information about where these peaks ought to be relative to the other peak in this model. And we should be able to apply this to the ionic liquid for which we're preparing a peak model. So let us see, this is the ionic liquid where we have one to one. So if I take the offset and copy this, go to the original peak model that was being developed, and we need to find the two components that represent the same ionic liquid. So if I now introduce in here A and I enter the offset and press return, the peaks moved to the opposite direction, so I need to put a minus sign here. And I now have an offset that tells me the relationship between these two peaks were actually reasonably well defined. As you can see, the residual is damaged, but not significantly damaged by the introduction of this offset. And if I say fit at this point, I end up with a reasonable residual. And now I have some confidence that this offset here is correct for one ionic liquid. So the other ionic liquid, the offset here, should match what I've calculated for the first ionic liquid here. The test of this peak model will be to apply it to these other ionic liquids that are in different proportions and see how well these peaks represent the differences in these two ionic liquids. So I've made a selection that includes all of the ionic liquids that are mixtures. I've omitted the two for which I've already prepared a peak model. And then if I right click, I get the browser operations dialog window. And this allows me to propagate from the spectrum displayed in the active tile to these selected VAMAS blocks. So the, these here are listed in this table. So having observed the list and the selection is correct, I will then propagate regions, components, and I'll also auto fit. So I've now got the peak model that has been applied to each one of these mixtures. So in theory, I'm now measuring the relationship between the ionic liquids based on a peak model that has been constructed and uses constraints in terms of area and position. We have a constraint that relates the component in column C to the component in column D. So there are a range of different constraints here that have all contributed to allowing a peak model for which we can then calculate the ratio of these two ionic liquids. Another observation about these data is that these nitrogen are all measured as independent measurements. And as a result, the spread in the binding energies for each individual measurement is a result of the acquisition conditions at the time these spectra were, were measured. And so we need to calibrate these to have a uniform binding energy if we're interested in looking at the binding energy for any of these peaks as representative of different chemical states within these materials. Now while that would be necessary if we're interested in the binding energies, if we're only interested in the relative proportions, then it really doesn't matter that these peaks are shifted when we do the analysis, provided we are using nonlinear least squares that can accommodate shifts in peak position as well as changes in heights. And this is one of the differences between peak fitting using nonlinear least squares and linear least squares optimization, which would require the calibration of these data prior to any fitting procedure. If we wish to create a profile from these data, then one of the things we need to do is give different names to these ionic liquids. So IL1, I need to use the same name for the other peak in this IL1, that is ionic liquid 1. And similarly, I'm going to give a name here, IL2. And these names are used as part of the quantification tables. And right now, I have changed the names 
for the ionic liquid components only for one VAMAS block. That is the active VAMAS block within the active display tile. So in order to propagate all of these names to these other components so that they will all have the same names, there's an option that says copy names. And this works on the basis of the selection. So when I say copy names, it'll list, just as it did with the propagate option, the names of the VAMAS blocks and the files from which these VAMAS blocks derive. So I can say OK. And now every single one will have the same name. This means that I can select the VAMAS blocks that have the components that are defined for these mixtures of ionic liquids. If I bring up the report spec page on the quantification parameters dialog window, I can create on the basis of components two entries in this custom report, one for each of the ionic liquids, and when I generate a report, the selected VAMAS blocks allow me to see how these ionic liquids change in relative proportion as a function of the sample and these samples were all prepared with different proportions of the ionic liquids and we can see this here in the table.